in today's episode of the Iman Wire podcast. So I think this debate is is relevant for us because it shows how scholars elevated Maryam to the highest paradigm that they had available. Some saw her as a prophet, some saw her as a righteous, but regardless, there's this kind of this ijmat, this is consensus that whatever scholar you're reading, they saw her as a model of emulation for both men and women. Women were not seen as something that was elevated. They were not seen as even full human beings, right? But more as a burden on society, which is why you, you had to bury them. And yet, in spite of all that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is acknowledging the male is not like the female. You may have your presuppositions about what a female is and what their, their place should be in society, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying they're not the same. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the Iman Wire podcast. Salim here with uh, my co host, Shad Imam. Assalamu alaikum, Shad. Wa alaikum salam. It's good seeing you again, good Salim. Good seeing you. It's been a while. Yeah, it has know, been. Alhamdulillah. Um, it's good to have you on with us. Um, and joining us together uh, is our dear uh, brother, Professor Yunus Mirza, who is a visiting researcher at Georgetown University. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Nice to see you guys again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I think the last time we were together, we were talking about um, it was actually leading up to Hajj season. That's right. Um, yeah, I remember we that. We were talking about uh, the sons of sacrifice. We we're talking about uh, whether, uh, you know, the story of the sacrifice of the son of Ibrahim, whether it's Ismail or Ishaq. Um, that was a long time ago. It was. Uh, and it's kind of interesting now that we're getting into, uh, into Ramadan. Yeah, here. So yeah you, exactly. You, you, tend to, you tend to get us right around the, the major holidays, mashallah. Yeah, so uh, we're here to talk about um, Professor Yunus Mirza's um, work. He's working on a book about the Islamic Mary. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll like, talk about that in a second. We're going to today, inshallah, try to talk a little bit about some of the the, issue, the the reflections, if you will, about the, the Quranic narrative of uh, Mary Malayhi uh, Salam. But first, Yunus, first tell us a little bit what made you interested in trying to work on a book uh, on this topic specifically. One of the things from going back to our last podcast <laughs> was we talked about the sons of sacrifice. And that was during a time where I wrote a book on the Quran and Bible. So we compared different biblical and Quranic figures uh, and we actually count 40 figures are, are shared between the Bible and the Quran. So during that time, especially after 9-11, and you know, there's a lot of interfaith and interreligious movements that focus on Abrahamic religions and Abrahamic dialogue. But recently there's been a shift I've seen where people are interested in questions about female spirituality, leadership, also uh, dialogue between Christians and Muslims. So there's been this focus on um, on the Mary and the, the Islamic Mar- uh, Mary or Maryam, and that's how I kind of shifted and got interested in this topic. So, yeah. So I mean, I think when we think of of of, uh, of Maryam, a lot of times we obviously connect her with Isa alayhi salam, right? So the the Quran itself it pairs the two of them, right? You know, Isa bin Maryam, right? And then Maryam's story is also a lot of times spoken of in the context of Isa alayhi salam. Um, and as a result, a lot of times when we do talk about Maryam, it's in relationship to Isa. But the Quran, very uh, interestingly, spends a good amount of, of time talking about Maryam alayhi salam before she was was even with uh, Isa alayhi salam. To use our current vernacular, like the origin story, right? Like <laughs> you're talking about what's the origin story of Maryam alayhi salam. Oh uh, yeah, that's excellent uh, insight because... When we engage in maybe Christian Muslim dialogue, people think of Maryam or Mary as just the mother of Jesus, right? She just gives birth to Isa, and that's her role. So her role is really just to bring Isa into the world. But when we look in the Quran, as you mentioned, there's an origin story. There's a birth story about Maryam, right? So it's actually before, uh, if you look uh, look from the beginning to the end of the Quran, you see that Ali and Imran, there is a discussion of Maryam before we get to Surah to Maryam where we talk about the birth of, of Jesus and Isa. So this demonstrates that she is an important figure in her own right. She's not just there in the Quran, in the Islamic tradition to bring Isa, but she is a model of spirituality for everyone. You know, it's interesting um, if you connect if you connect it always to, to the seat of the Prophet, والسلام, one of the Early incidences, and you know this is is around the the, the story in Abyssinia, right? Of Jafar ibn Abi Talib, and 
speaking before the Najashi, and we know for a fact that it was from Surat Maryam that he actually recited. So it, even it, I always think about it in terms of even early on in the Dawah, there was kind of this mention of Maryam alayhi salam in the Quran by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it was used as a means to actually, you know, have a discussion with at the time Najashi. Right around what what are the Islamic precepts here? So to your point, Salim, it's an origin story that has a very practical manifestation in in how it was applied. It wasn't just a information to be had in the past, but it was actually used in terms of dialogue and, and discussion with with the people at the time, even in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Right. Yeah. And so um, you know, let's get into a little bit of the story because actually the interesting thing also the story is not we just don't hear about the mother of Isa alayhi salam, Maryam, but we also hear about the grandmother of Isa alayhi salam. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of uh, in sort of Al Imran, it's it's actually through her lens, through the grandmother, uh, that we sort of get introduced to Maria Malaysia. So if you could speak a little bit about that, yeah. So that that's a uh, another nice observation that <clears throat> the origin stories starts out where uh, it talks about the mother, right? So the mother she wants to have a child, and she's mm-hmm. dedicating that child to uh, worship, and she is someone that wants that child to love God and and be part of the community. However, right, she has a girl. So at that time, and even till today, that you see that when most religious leaders or many are male. So she's concerned and she says, how is it, or what am I supposed to do now that I have this daughter, right? And now she was not going to be able to uh, serve in the temple and serve in the the mihrab. So, and as she says, you know, قَالَتْ رَبِّ إِنِّي وَضَعْتُهَا أُنْثَى وَاللَّهُ أَعْنَمُ بِمَا وَضَعْتُ So she says clearly that, uh, you know, I, I gave birth to, to a girl and as a father of three girls <laughs> myself, <laughs> uh, and I don't actually have any sons, this was kind of struck me as, as important that she is now in, in a state of disbelief and maybe even disappointment that what is this girl going to do? But the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds and says no, that God knows that uh, what you have given bear to and that the male is not like the female. And however, the Quran affirms her, Maryam. so that even though she's a girl, she's still honored. She is given a name. And that her progeny, her dhoriya, is protected from shaitan. Is this uh, the grandmother of Isa speaking, or is this like the Quran speaking about? Is that is that is that understood, or is it is it ambiguous? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So, the my reading, and maybe I have to write another book on this to <laughs> do some more research. <laughs> but this is kind of introduction. Uh, in, that here it's the Quran kind of inserting and saying. Mm-hmm. Uh, that the male is not like the female. So we see earlier that you know she does kind of speak to God and complain, and we'll see this later when we talk about Surah to Maryam, where Maryam is actually complaining to God, but then the Quran responds, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains that the genders are different. Right. I, I think the reason I mentioned is because I, this specific phrase is utilized in very mm-hmm. different contexts, mm-hmm. right? So it's interesting to see how it is for like the context of the verse itself, right? What exactly is the is the is the meaning by saying that the male is not like the female here? Yeah, that, I think it, it's something, and maybe Shah can you know jump in here. But how I understand it, it, it is affirming in some ways what she's saying that I I gave birth to you know a girl, and uh, the and the Quran is affirming and saying yes, uh, you did give birth to a girl, and the girl is is not like the male. However, the the woman is still honored and still affirmed. And you see this throughout the Quran. Uh, in some of my articles, I talk about how the Quran emphasizes uh, the female birth, the kids. So we know that during the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that many women and, and girls, when they were born, they were actually buried alive. Right? So they're, وَإِذَا الْمَعُودَةُ سُعِدَتْ Right? And famous in Surah Al-Takwir, Talking about this, how this mauda, this this female child was actually buried, and then on the day of judgment, it's either suirat or is questioned or said that she actually asks and says, "Why was I 
actually buried. And this, I think, also affirms daughters in the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we know this beautiful relationship that he had with his daughters. He didn't have any sons that grew up to adulthood. He had children like Ibrahim that passed away earlier on. And this relationship between him and Fatima, which is discussed and romanticized within the seerah and other literature. So there is this really unique aspect here in the Quran about affirming uh, daughters and uh, affirming that they are have potential to be righteous and models of emulation. I mean, I don't know about Ayusha, but one of the things that I found, I actually find this phrase beautiful because like all the gems of the Quran, there's so many different shades of meaning you can take from it. You can yeah. take from the meaning of itself inside yeah. the story, right? Uh, Maryam's mother is concerned because she wanted her her child to be like in service of yeah. of of you know the sacred space, right? And then she's concerned because oh wait, she's a she's a she's a girl. Mm-hmm. Girls can't serve in the in the temple, right? Yeah. And so like from that like intrinsic like meaning in the in the statement, it's like there's 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 this um, meaning there, and, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is is uh, telling us that. Uh, no, this this female, this girl is a lot not like any other male. You know, it, it, you're one hundred percent right, Salim. And I think one one thing we should think about is the audience, right? In terms of as this is being revealed to the Prophet Islam, he's got to take this out to the Quraysh, right? At the time, and what we know about the society, right, Yunus? What you were just saying is they buried their daughters alive. It was a very patriarchal, in fact, we could argue a very misogynistic type of society, and it's in that that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is deliberately elevating the status of a woman in a society where they are seen as basically second, third, fourth class citizens. And yet, you know, it it must have been jarring for those early Arabs to really see this in action, right? Be, and, and hear it and say, yeah, you know, this is something I wouldn't even have considered. Why would I even talk about a woman or talk about you know, a fly or an ant or all of these diff- other kind of similitudes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives in the Quran. Um, but it, it was even not just from a linguistic standpoint, but I think even from just a, a, a situational standpoint where they were in their societies, women were not seen as something that was elevated. They were not seen as even full human beings, right? But more as a burden on society, which is why you you had to bury them. And yet in spite of all that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is acknowledging the male is not like the female. You may have your presuppositions about what a female is and what their their place should be in society, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying they're not the same. Yeah, you know, one of the things also, like, you know, when you say, I mean, obviously, uh, in English at least, when you say, like, you know, it's just not like this. Like, usually yeah. there's a there's a implication that the thing that you're saying first is not as good as the thing that's second, right? It's like, you know, I'll... You know, this is this food is not as good as my mom's, right? Mm-hmm. It's just not the same, right? <laughs> so it's like almost like you know, it's it's and I think you can take it both ways. I think mm-hmm. it's just affirming both. I think it affirms masculinity and affirms femininity. It yeah. affirms that yeah. a man can can hear that phrase and be like, yeah, the man's not like a woman, like you know, like okay, yeah, like I'm a man, right? I can sometimes it can be to an, to a different level, but like I think just having confidence in like that you are a man, just as you can have confidence that you are a woman, and mm-hmm. that there's you know there's differences that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has. Has has delineated here, but like that doesn't mean that that affirming one is throwing shade on the other. Yeah, that's what Iksan was saying. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think you're right. And here, you know, in, in this specific story and in this context, where you have the mother saying, "Hey, I, I I wanted to raise somebody in the house of God and to have those types of things that she knew at that time were probably only afforded to men, right? right? And so she's thinking, what's going to happen now? Right. Like now I've delivered a female. I can't fulfill those same things because society has told me that I can't. So, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, saying, no, don't worry. Right. We're going to name her Maryam and you will see that what, what she will grow up to be. And then from there on, we hear in the story, then, you know, her uncle. Right. You know, uh, Prophet Zakaria. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, he's a facilitator really to her service. You know, that he's this um, her uncle in her life is instrumental in 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 supporting her in her service right and i guess you know some 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 the question rhetorical question might be added, like you know what would what would our life be like if if mariam alayhisam had been barred from serving in the sacred space right you know i think that echoes a lot to some of the issues we have today right but like talk a little bit about you know her relationship with uh, with zakaria 
Yeah, so Zachary is a, a fascinating figure, mashallah, in, in, in terms that he comes and he's a caretaker for uh, Maryam. And he begins to actually look after her, وَكَثَّلَهَا Zakaria. So mm-hmm. this idea of watching over and looking at her upbringing and, and being entrusted with her. So one of the things that occurs is that Zakaria comes and visits uh, Maryam. So when he visits her, he, he finds wajida indaha rizqa. So he finds that there's sustenance. So this leads to a, a fascinating dialogue where Zakaria begins to ask Maryam. So this is, as you mentioned, an interesting dynamic. You have now the uncle who's male, who's older, who's asking this young woman, where did you get these provisions? And uh, he, she responds and says, min This is from God. So God has the ability, he's a razaq, to provide to whoever he wills without any measurement or limit. So we find this dynamic where she's kind of teaching Zechariah a lesson. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we see this also mm-hmm. that they kind of mimic each other or they have a, a, their shadows of one another in Surah Maryam. Uh, so there is this play in the Quran where they, the, you know, there's this intentional interaction between Zechariah and Maryam, and they both kind of build upon each other. But in this particular verse in Ali Imran, you see that she's a spiritual teacher and mentor and guide almost to Zakaria. And this actually leads to a, a template within Islamic tradition where you have a group of female teachers and mystics who begin actually teaching religious scholars. So you mm-hmm. have Rabia Adawiyah, the very famous, as, as you know, that she's someone who walked in the streets of, of Basra uh, exclaiming her love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and devotion to him. But she also had a group of uh, male followers that actually would study from her and learn from her, such as Sophia Nathori. And he was a, a muhaddith and someone who focused on the textual tradition, male, older scholar. But he would actually come to her and, and uh, she would teach him different things. There's a famous story where he comes and he he starts complaining that he doesn't have safety in this world and that he's feeling in a state of unrest. And then she starts to cry. And then he says, what did I do to make you cry? And she said, and she responds and said, that safety you're seeking is, is in your heart and in your mind. It's not in the world around you. You need to actually rethink your spiritual state. Mm-hmm. And this is Rabia telling a muhaddith, <laughs> yeah. uh, making him rethink his understanding of the world. So we have this part of our tradition that it's not only in the Quran or the Hadith, but goes throughout uh, of of these mystical women who are teaching spiritual lessons to mixed audiences. Yeah, and even in this case to a, a prophet, right? Zakaria alayhi salam, right? I mean, it, was, it didn't bar him from both being educated by a woman and then her teaching him and saying, hey, this is, Allah is the one that provides. And he's given it to me. And this, and and the beautiful thing of it is that you know it's it's a reminder, you know I think the humility of 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 Prophet Zakaria, right? Yeah. Like it reminds me of of Musa and his humility with yeah. Al-Qadr, right? Like this is something that we see through all the NBA. Like they have they have humility, right? I mean, he's he's a he's he's a he's a prophet of Allah, and yet he's he's taking this lesson from his niece. You yeah. know, I don't know how old she was, but she was probably young, I presume. But like, you know, he's taking it and then he uses it. Yeah. And then he prays. He's like, he's like, oh, a fruit is coming out of season and she's getting this miracle. Well, maybe I can, I can, uh, we, there's still a chance for us to have a baby out of season. Yeah, out of will, season. You know, yeah, sort of yeah. the, the metaphor as used uh, there. Um, so, uh, you know, I want to move a little bit into like, you know, Surah Maryam now. I mean, but like, I, I think us, we've established, you know, that the, the Quran as you described uh, Maryam alayhi salam as this um, paragon of virtue and um, uh, spirituality. Before we get into a little bit in some of the narrative in, in Surah Maryam and your reflections, is there anything in her name itself that uh, that bears any any interesting meaning or reflection about the name Maryam? Yeah, so the name Maryam is, is unique because it's actually not an Arabic name, right? Mm-hmm. So as you know, Arabic has a, the three letters for each root. And uh, this name is in, in many ways imported into the Arabic language and to the Arabian Peninsula. So for those who studied Arabic, this is Mamnu' Mi Asarf. So you see that her name is Maryam, and then it doesn't actually take the different uh, tashkil and, 
conjugations. conjugations that yeah. exactly that you normally have with, with the Arabic name. So this is also demonstrates that Muslims and Islam is open to these different religious and righteous figures that when, when people think they think Maryam or Jesus, oh, that's Christianity. But in fact, they, there's affirmation of Maryam that Islam can incorporate uh, figures from different religions and make it their own. And that's part of the, the whole idea of my book, that there is an Islamic uh, Mary, there's a Maryam, that yes, it, there's some origins in Christianity and within the Bible, but Islam has a unique take on her and her reception. Which, I mean, it goes to what you mentioned earlier, Bashad, about how, you know, uh, Jafar in his wisdom yeah. used these verses that we're going to talk about, inshallah, Surah Maryam, like specifically chose these verses yeah. um, in his in his uh, presentation to uh, Najashi. So, I mean, if we can get a little bit into um, Surah Maryam, I mean, just first of all, before getting into the story of Surah Maryam, any, any unique elements about Surah Maryam as a whole? I mean, it doesn't speak just only about Maryam al Islam, but we'll, we'll talk about, you know, her particularly, but the surah also encompasses other things. It talks about Zakaria and it goes beyond, after talking about Surah Mary, uh, Maryam, it talks about some of the other NBA as well. Um, but any like broad um, points about Surah Maryam or unique things about Surah Maryam that you want to, um, you know, um, speak about? Yeah, absolutely. So Surah Maryam is a remarkable surah and the more I read it and study it, there's so, there's so many things that are unique about it. So some some of the elements is that it's the only surah that starts with kaf, ha, ya, ayn, salat. Right? So as you know, there are different surahs in the Quran, and many of them start with this huruf al muqatla these displaced letters, like alif, la, mim, or noon, or hamim. So when you look at the Quran, a lot of contemporary scholars, they actually understand these as clusters, chronic clusters. So the alif, la, mim surahs, here's surah Baqarah, Ali Imran, then you look at Alif Lam Ra, Surah Al Ra'ad, Yusuf. Then you have surahs like Hamim that go together, as far as Zuhruf and others. So if you look at these surahs, the majority of scholars say, oh, these are now revealed at similar times, that they're understood to have similar themes. For example, if you look at Ya Ayyul Muzammil and Ya Ayyul Mudathir, kind of similar beginnings. But they have a similar idea of preaching, early, very early Meccan era, idea of spirituality, not paying attention to the disbelievers, being patient. So here, this is the only surah with this beginning. So there are, there are surahs like this, like Surah Tanun, for instance, that's the only surah that has that. So it's kind of unique in many ways. And it's unique also because it has this rhyme scheme that continues out. And this is the only surah that has this rhyme scheme. So we talked about, for example, Surah Al-Mudathir, you know, Ya Ayyul Al-Mudathir, Kum Fa'andir. So there's this kind of raw rhyme scheme that goes throughout it. But here we see this I, this Iya. So you see that in the, in the beginning it mentions Zakariya, and then it talks about Khafiya, and then it goes Shaqiya, and so forth. And it's remarkable that this rhyme scheme goes throughout the whole surah. There's only a couple of verses that don't have this rhyme scheme. And uh, this kind of, once again, emphasizes the uniqueness of, of Surah al Maryam and the story of uh, Maryam. Also, you see that this is a the only surah that has the word wid in it, which means love. So you know the name of al-wadud. So right. God is the most loving. So that is, as I mentioned here. And it's a surah that many scholars would say is late Meccan. So, it's, so similar to what Shah mentioned about this is surah that was found and recited to the Najashi. So this is not early surah like Surah Al-Madathir or, or Iqra, for instance, but this is one that is later and that the early Muslim community they identified with because Maryam and Zakaria talk about their weaknesses, they talk about their vulnerabilities, they talk about their desperations. So you can hear how the early Muslim community might have been slandered or ridiculed. Mm -hmm. And here she is uh, being defended by God as well as her her infant son. Uh, yeah, well, you know, one of the other things that um, uh, is always striking when you read uh, Surah Maryam is um, the the amount of times that Rahman is mentioned. Mm. I mean, I just I don't think you know, even if you're not familiar with the Arabic language, like you just just notice it. I don't know how many times it's mentioned. Do you know how many times? Is it I happened? believe it's sixteen times. Yeah. So it's actually it's a great point that if you look at 
how Zechariah, Maryam, or even the other prophets that I mentioned in the surah refer to God is always with the Rahman. Mm-hmm. So this idea of God being merciful and merciful on the believer, merciful on the community, that he has the power to destroy and to punish. But these figures are asking for his his mer- mercy. And then you know the verse, وَبِلْ مُؤْمِنِينَ رَحِيمَ So he is kind of kind and gracious to those who believe. No, and then of course, then you know Rahman, and then you have Rahma, you have the womb, right, yeah, which are connected. Rahman, yeah, and then the great. surah is talking about you know miraculous births. You know, it's very interesting. <laughs> Rahim is the womb, right? And so you have the story of Maryam alayhi salam in that, um, talking about this miraculous birth. Just to your to your point earlier, uh, you know, it, it is also interesting that the surah itself, again talking about kind of revelation, it doesn't actually start with. Uh, Isa alayhi salam, right? It doesn't start with like, I mean, I, mm-hmm. I, again, I'm thinking about this in terms of, of the conversation that Jafar bin Abi Talib must have had with, with Najashi. It, it doesn't go straight into, hey, the most controversial thing between our religions is the fact that there's, there's Isa alayhi salam who was either a, you know, who was a, a prophet versus a son of God. That it actually begins with a neutral figure, Zakaria. Right. I mean, I remember one of my teachers once said he's probably the least controversial figure in between all of our religions. Right. Zechariah, there's not a lot that you can really have controversy about him, but that's how it starts. And it it's almost kind of giving us a framework for when you're engaging in this dialogue, when you're engaging in this dialogue, you don't you have to build on some type of a foundation. It doesn't have to start with, hey, let me address the most contentious issue in the room first. Let's build up to that. The story of Zechariah, which gives us a story of, which is intertwined with the story of Maryam, which then gives us the context for the birth of Isa alayhi salam. Now let's have a discussion around those things, right? It, it's almost, uh, you know, I, I come, you know this, I come, I work in the sales world, right? And when you have objections, you want to start by disarming those objections, by kind of setting the tone and saying, hey, let, let's start here and then let's get to your point, right? So even Jafar talking to Najashi, He's saying, I'll answer your question. Let's let's go to the story of Zachariah and see what brought him to Maryam alayhi salam before we go into the miraculous birth of Isa alayhi salam. Right? I just think there's a there's kind of a what do they call it? Yunus Tadrij, right? There's like a, a build up to that process. It's almost like it's done in, in certain uh it's it's done step by step to, to get to get somebody to where you want them to go. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's to your point that I actually read for the, in the book I have a chapter talking about this encounter with Najashi. Mm. And it's a remarkable hadith from Umm Salama. So she's one of the wives of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And at, t- at the time, she was not married to him uh, yet. And she was living as a Muslim minority, basically in a Christian majority country and nation. And she talks about exactly that, that when they were called and they wanted to hear, <laughs> you know, what do you Muslims believe about Christianity? They recited Surah Maryam. But they recited the, and focused on the story of Maryam. And then he famously kind of draws this line in the ground and says, hey, the difference between us is, is this line. So mm-hmm. the Kufar uh, of Quraysh, they're really upset about this. But they actually come back uh, the next day, Amr bin As and so forth. <laughs> He's very smart, strategic. And he tells Najasi, they, they, talk, they talk to you about Maryam, but t- ask them about Jesus. Right, so he he knows that there is this theological difference that these Muslims have uh, on on Jesus uh, with Christians. So he calls them back, and they're really scared, and they don't know what to say. But then Jafar ibn Abi Talib, he's honest on what they think about Jesus, and and mentions that we understand him to be a prophet and not the son of God. But Najashi, because of which I just mentioned, the tajrij, you know, there's also the tartib or the order of, of the surah, that he's already had this affinity and mm-hmm. affection for Maryam and how that was uh, reflected within the Quran, mm-hmm. that he didn't feel that he needed to expel them or have them go back with the Quraysh tribe. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a good point, like, as you mentioned, Shad, about, I mean, really about Dawah, right? It's mm-hmm. like, you know, you have to... I don't want to say strategic, but I would have to be sort of be. Uh, you have to start with a with a with a certain point mm-hmm. that can bring uh, about a, lo- a bigger discussion. Yeah. But then to the to the next point, like you know, when there's still differences, you have to be authentic. Mm-hmm. And so you know, Jafar was authentic. Yeah. They were the Muslims were authentic yeah. at that time. They were authentic. They but they were still um, smartened with the, how they presented these topics, Correct. which can be divisive. But you still have to you know outline those differences. You know, it's and, not like you know like you know. 
uh, some people think interfaith work is just like all like, oh, it's like, you know, kumbaya, but <laughs> right, right. good interfaith work is really about talking about this, but within the context of a broader uh, discussion. And there's a foundation, I think a foundation of commonality, right? That, that Jafar, that he was, that he was trying to establish, right? And if you go, if you go back into the Sita, like that whole discussion, it takes place over a few days in which he's talked about, we came to you because you were a just king. We came to you because we heard of your justice. We came to you because we were being oppressed in our lands. And then it gets to the, again, he, he's already kind of primed Najashi. So now when it comes to actually talking about our deen, right? It's like, look, the commonality is, first of all, you, you have a Zakaria, we have a Zakaria. You have a Maryam, we have a Maryam. You have an Isa, we have an Isa, right? Now let's go into kind of what the difference is in our understanding of the two, right? And and I think that that's actually a really important point for us um, because we sometimes go to, and, and there's a lot of Islamophobia that's out there. So there's a lot that we have to combat in terms of misperceptions. And sometimes we start by trying to attack the misperception itself mm-hmm. without laying a foundation for what does Islam actually say? Where's, where, where is it actually coming from before we go into addressing some of these concerns, right? right. Yeah, so let's let's go into a little bit of the narrative of, about the birth of Isa with with Maryam. You know, this this is the this is the the same selection that was recited that brought you know a Najashi and his court to tears. So, uh, some of your reflection, inshallah, from that. Yeah. So one of the things that is, is mentioned here is that she secludes herself from her family in this kind of eastern place, and then she actually. A messenger, Rasul, comes to her and then says that you're going to get this Ghunam and Zakiya, this this righteous, pure child. So she asks this question here, she, and and this is part of maybe goes back to our our previous podcast. So she says, "How can this happen?" Right, and this kind of reminds me of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So Ibrahim, he has this dream, you know, in manam and tara. He says to his son. Oh, what do you think about this? I'm having this dream that I'm slaughtering you. Tell me what you think, right? And that's it's remarkable, <laughs> you know, that a father is asking their son this and generally trying to get shura, understand what what they perceive on this. So here you see something similar. She says, anna She says, how am I supposed to have a child? Wanam yam sasni bashar. Mm-hmm. Right? And there had never been a man or a human that's ever touched me. Right. So here in the Arabic language, we call this kenaya or euphemism. So she's saying literally no man has even touched me. Mm-hmm. But she's talking about a relationship. Right. Mm-hmm. She's never had any type of intercourse or marriage and she hasn't been unchaste. So Jabir responds, says, you know, that this will occur. Mm-hmm. And this is something that's easy for him. So what's unique here is that she accepts. So she questions. She's not silent. She could have said, oh, you know, whatever God says. But once she understands it's a divine order and command, she affirms it. And some of the scholars actually compare her with Zechariah. So you see, if you go earlier in the chapter, Mm -hmm. Zechariah is also given a child. But then he asks for a sign. He says, give me an ayah. And mm-hmm. the ayah is that he's not supposed to speak for mm-hmm. three days. But here, Maryam doesn't ask for a sign. So some of the scholars like Qurtubi, they actually speak highly, say Maryam is in, in their ranking higher than Zakaria mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. she doesn't necessarily need a sign. She realizes it, it's it's from, from God. I mean, if, if we go further in the story, right? So she withdraws uh, from the people. She's, she's been told she's going to have this... Um, you know, this, this child. And then we have a, a quite actually detailed description in a way of uh, of her labor, you know? I mean, like, it's very mm. striking that, that the Quran speaks about something which I don't think, is, going back to your early point mm. about the context of what the Quran is, where the Quran is being revealed, you know, in 7th century Arabia, where, you know, um, where women were disregarded and mm-hmm. their experiences were disregarded. And then you have the Quran speaking yeah. about, you know, labor, which is this uniquely female experience and you know, we hear about it in, the, in this in this way that I'm sure many of the the, the listeners never even yeah. I mean they wouldn't they wouldn't be around they wouldn't even know what women go through and yet the Quran is this, is is describing this in in some detail. Yeah, so that's a great observation that we we talked earlier that the Quran has this unique emphasis on daughters. 
uh, within the Quran. We also see it has a unique emphasis on labor, talking about how women will actually conceive and and the pain and difficulty yeah. based on that. So you see in sort of Luqman and sort of Ahqaf verses that talk about, you know, that this was difficult and challenging. And here you see that uh, Maryam actually calls out. So this is, she says, قَالَتْ يَا لَيْتَنِي مِتُّ قَبْلَ هَذَا وَكُنْتُ نَسِيَمْ مَنْسِيَةً So she actually says, I wish I had died before this mm. and that I was something that was forgotten. So there is this really strong complaining to God and a vulnerability. And this arguably could be connected to earlier in the chapter. So you, if you go back uh, to to the, the early beginning of Surah Maryam, we see that Zechariah also complains to God. So this this chapter is really unique in terms of this idea of, of, of vulnerability, of talking about your weaknesses. So he asks for a child and he says, he says, So he, he says to God, he says, I'm old, <laughs> right? right, right. You know, I'm old, <laughs> meaning my, my bones have become brittle. They're weak. Yeah. And now uh, gray hair, my hair is all white, right? I don't have any, <laughs> any uh, black hair uh, left. And then he says to God, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَلَمْ أَكُمْ بِدُعَائِكَ رَبِّ شَقِيَ And when I came to you with any type of prayer, you never disappointed me. You never said mm. no. Right. So this is a, a clear emphasis of, of two spiritual and righteous figures kind of complaining to God about their state. And when they do that and they're really honest about their emotional state, and where they're coming from, you see there's always a response. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's, it, it really speaks to, you know, humanity of, of these figures which are being described, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's describing something very human, like a typical response. I mean, like when the, the, the words that come out of Maryam is, is something that anyone who has delivered a, a, a child can tell you that, you know, there's a certain state you're in of, pain, discomfort, like it, they, for them, it probably hits differently to hear what Mariam is saying, because it's like, yes, I know exactly what she's saying. You know, I, I think sometimes a lot of people, when they take up about that verse, like they look at it from a very macro level and like, you know, what is it saying spiritually about, you know, what state she's in? And that, that is true, but it's also, it can just be a very human experience of, of a woman dealing with the discomfort of labor and, you know, saying certain things because of her discomfort, you know. I also think it's just interesting that she says, I think you translated it, but basically to the effect of, would that I had died or, and that I was someone who was forgotten. And we know for a fact that she neither died nor is she forgotten, <laughs> right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like as uh, her name is, I mean, essentially immortalized, if you will, in the Quran and how many children do we know who are named Maryam and who will continue to be Mar- named Maryam and honoring her for what she what she went through, yeah. right? Um, just found that pretty fascinating. Sometimes the things that we think we want, especially in those moments, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us much better than that after. Yeah, and you could see that statement as being heretical in some ways, right? She's in... In one reading, you, you might say, oh, she's denying what God wanted right, from her, yeah, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But when you look at the Mufassiri and the commentators, they actually don't read it that way. They read it mm. more in terms of this is the suffering of the righteous. Yes. Yeah, they yeah. see it that all the righteous have gone through trials and tribulations, whether that's the Prophet Muhammad or whether it's Zakaria or Adi, that all of them went through something difficult yeah. and that pain is human to your kind of yeah. point, you know, and and that's probably maybe that's the subject for another podcast, right? But around uh, around really the, uh, you know, the the prophets themselves being tested, right? And the and, and the examples in the Quran that Allah gives us of people who are tested. I mean, Noah alayhi salam says what? Inni maghlubun fantasir. Oh Allah, I'm overwhelmed. So give me some help, right? Right? Um, I mean, how often do we feel overwhelmed? Right by life situations, whatever we have, maybe by by what's going on in Gaza, all this stuff. It's just it's inundating us, um, and it's. I think it's important for us to recognize that that that's what makes us human beings. That's what made the prophets humans, and that's why they're examples for us. So, uh, Isa alayhi salam is born, and then we have another description of this voice that comes out, you know, to reassure uh, Maryam. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah. So that she. So she is given, gives birth, and she actually calls out, and uh, God responds to her with these ripe dates. 
and it says wakuni washarabi wakarni aina right so this is a fascinating phrase that is telling her to eat to drink and to be happy and and see the child as a twinkle in your eye and this is actually a phrase that we in a common popular prayer that we make you know rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata ayun so we you know the popular prayer we, you know god bestow upon us uh, righteous offspring and spouses that are the pleasure of our eye so we can see that there is kind of this connection here between those verses and then it, it orders her and this is most commentators say this is jibreel it tells her if you see anyone fuqudi inni nadartu lir rahmani sawma fanan ukallim al yawma insiya so if anyone sees you or talks to you then say i've taken a vow to rahman so this is kind of to your point Salim, about how many times Rahman is mentioned. So it's not just God, right? It's the one who is the most compassionate. And what should I do? Do soma, som. So this is actually a, the word for fasting is used. Right, right. So when we think of fasting, we think primarily of food or drink. We think of Ramadan. But here is actually take a vow of silence, not speak. And that I'm not going to speak to anyone uh, today. So this is, leads to an interesting position where now she's going to go back to her people. She's going to carry Isa, Isanam, Jesus, and people are going to say stuff. They're going to say, hey, where did this child come from? Have you been sleeping around? Have you been unchaste? So how is she going to defend herself? So it, it mentions that in the next verse, So she comes to her people and she's carrying Isa, Isanam, and they accuse her qalu ya maryam laqad ja'ti shay'an fariya that it's you've come something that's horrible something that's despicable and they think that she's had a child out of a uh, wedlock so here you can also hear some of the the slanders and some of the the things that maybe they the muslim community was also uh, being subject to from the of the Quraysh tribe and and the polytheists at at the time and then they say, uh, "Ya ukhta Harun." So this is fascinating because they're talking to her family name, right? And they're saying, "Look, you come from a good family. We know your mom, your dad, Makana Abuki, you know, Imra. So he was not a bad person. Wa Makanat Ummuki Bariya, and your mother was not unchaste, right? You you come from a righteous family, right? <laughs> your parents are on the board, right? They're they're the the president, the, the chairperson." And she's referred to here as Ukht. So Maryam is described in the Quran as Um, as we know. And that's kind of the primary, maybe way most people understand her as a mother. But she's also described as Ibna in the Quran, you know, Ibna to Imran. So she's described, as we just talked about, Ali Imran, as the daughter. And here we see that she's just, uh, just described as Ukht, as a sister. So there's three different ways <laughs> in the Quran that. You can uh, speak about her, and then she, as she she made this vow of silence, she can't speak. So fa So she points to her child, and they say, How how are we supposed to speak to this child when he's in his cradle? <laughs> and then uh, he defines himself, and then begins to speak. Qala inni Abdullah, and he says, "I am the servant of God." So in a way, her silence actually leads to the speech of, of Jesus, of Isa. Mm. So if she actually spoke and she started defending herself, people would not believe her, right? And they would say, oh, yeah, of course you're going to defend yourself. But when the child speaks, <laughs> right, miraculously, then uh, it's a miracle and she is affirmed and validated. So I think there is this play within Surta Maryam of speech and silence. So you see Zakaria, yeah. he makes this really passionate prayer and he says look i'm old my my bones are brittle my hair is all white you know you haven't disappointed me ever give me a son and then god responds but then he's supposed to be silent so after he spoke mm -hmm. he's supposed to be silent for three days and then after maryam speaks and talks about how she wished she had died and was long forgotten and she wished she was something not mentioned god responds and actually provides uh, for her gives her her son, gives her peace and tranquility. And then when people talk to her, uh, Isa is the one that speaks. What, what, are, what are your um, like reflections in terms of this silence 
um, that, you know, Zakaria has to do at a certain point, and then Mariam also has to do, like, in terms of, and you described how it's, it's um, Som, right? Like, how does this connect maybe for us, like, you know, as we're fasting, how, how does it give us some insight into some of the, the deeper realities of fasting? Yeah, so when I, when, I find, when I read this, sometimes you read the Quran and you read a surah and you're like, oh, I didn't see that <laughs> there. And that was something when I read Surah Maryam for the fifth or sixth time, then I saw, oh, wow, Som is right there. And I hadn't really seen it or paid attention. So a lot of times, as I, as we mentioned, so much talk about fasting and Ramadan mm-hmm. and food and drink. But this use of the word here really gets back to the origins of the word. So the mm-hmm. origins is imsak or preventing yourself or abstaining. Mm-hmm. So here we begin to get to the origins of the word in, in the sense that this is abstaining from something, abstaining from speech. And this is actually part of our tradition as well. You have this idea of so many lisan. You know, the, the soma of right. the tongue, that there's hadith that says, How many people have fasted? And the only thing they get from it is yeah. food, food, they, they, food and drink, and hunger and thirst, yeah. exactly. That they haven't really benefited. They're still backbiting, right? They're still talking trash, they're still critiquing other people, but they haven't really enhanced their spiritual level. And then there's this hadith that also talks about. Right? So whoever believes in God and the day of judgment, say something that's good or be silent. Right. Mm-hmm. So silence is also part of the the understanding of in our in our religion. And then you also see that Ghazadi has this beautiful chapter about fasting. And he talks about the different levels of fasting. And the most basic one is the fast of food and drink. But if you go to the higher tiers, there is a fasting of the eyes, right? There's a fasting of of the mind. There's a fasting of the limbs, and there's a fasting of the of the tongue. So this is kind of helps us as we contemplate or think about Ramadan. That Ramadan has these moments of khalwa, being isolated, of i'tikaf, of re- secluding yourself in the last couple of days of the month, and it's a time for you to reflect and meditate and try to understand yourself in relation. Right, that they are the believers are in the constant state of tadabbur or ta'amul or contemplation, tafakkur, thinking about the relationship with the transcendent. No, no, you know, I was, I was just going to mention that um, in modern context, I think silence can take a number of different forms, right? Because when we tend to think about silence, we think about no noise. But if we look at it at a personal level, especially in today's world, um, silence can really be applied to commenting, right? It's not just a silence in terms of not speaking, which in and of itself is difficult for us nowadays, but um, also not commenting, whether it's online or in social media, on any and everything that's around us. Um, I, I think we tend, to, we tend to forget that, you know, just because there aren't sounds being made, that does not necessarily mean that we're being silent, Right. And in fact, you have a lot of people that um, I, and I know I'm sure you all, have, you know, they use Ramadan as a means to not just fast from food and drink, but perhaps even from social media, you know, from online presences, from things like that, because we have gotten into a kind of a, a culture now where we're, we need to comment and speak about any and everything that's happening in the world, whether it relates to us or not. Um, and so this kind of focus on silence and fasting, I think is actually more critical for us now to focus on that area than it than maybe it has been in the past with just food and drink and, and some of those things. Of course, there's there's lots of benefit to that. But if we're talking about how we spiritually elevate ourselves, right, the idea of the Prophet Ali himself only speaking at measured at measured times, not going on at length, not not opining on everything that's out there, not we could use a lot more of that, I think, in our in our yeah, world today. Yeah, this is an excellent point. I mean, one of the one of the beautiful things uh, that I've heard from our teachers about this the story of Zachariah and Maryam, particularly with the, the, the Maryam story and sort of Maryam, is that you know, like her withdrawal and her silence. Right. This is all sort of like you know, in our modern par- parlance, would be like you know, unplugging yourself, mm-hmm. right? Like in silence and and not not uh, as you said. It's not just sound, but yeah. it's like it's just like it's just disengagement, yeah. disengagement yeah. from all the things around us, our phones, our media, uh, unnecessary conversation, all sorts of things. When you are able to unplug, as Mariam Alayhisalam did and had to do, really, what happens as a result of this um, experience for her is she gets this immense, amazing gift. Mm-hmm. 
physically on her son, right? But then the spiritual gift, this mm-hmm. honor, this amazing thing for the world, right? Mm-hmm. And so as our teachers teach us, like, you know, that by us doing the same, by by engaging in silence, by engaging in moments of solitude, this deeper levels of fasting, not just with the, the stomach, but with our limbs and our eyes and our ears and our tongues, right? Mm-hmm. That allows us or prepares us to receive immense spiritual gifts. And there's, of course, in Ramadan, we see this, right? I mean, we're going through all this month and then we have moments of the, in the month of Ramadan. We have those last 10 nights where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is preparing us through this experience. And then we have like the night of power. We have all these things that come out of it, right? Just like Maryam alayhi salam, she is, she's been given and we have been given through her all of these gifts because of this, um, this, this period and experience of fasting and, and secluding ourselves and disconnecting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that point, uh, Salim, that Ramadan starts and a lot of times it begins with iftars and the parties and dawats. But then towards the end, it goes, kind of focuses on the, the night of power, Layat al-Qadr, it talks about the uh, atikaf is prescribed and recommended. So actually people become, are very social, but then they kind of become very focused and they begin to become hopefully more silent and more reflective. Uh, as the month ends and then a climax in the in the Eid al Fitr. And I think one of the things I think you guys, I mean, I mean, we all experience this in Ramadan. There's that um, the sociability in Ramadan is like you know it's one of the lights of Ramadan, right? And uh, but as you said, like as the month progresses, the sociability becomes directed not towards one another, but it becomes a sociability directed towards only towards Allah. So like everybody, you feel this cohesive feeling in in like in in the night prayers, right? And it's like everybody is on like in resonance, right? Mm-hmm. And it's not so much that, you know, we're uh, we're not like, it's not like we're not social with the people around us. We are, but it's like with this higher purpose and this just immense, um, just weight of, of what we're doing basically and the sort of unity that we see that's so beautiful that we see, especially in the last 10 nights. Mm-hmm. No, that's a, a great point. I think the last 10 days you see more people, maybe, right, right. Right? <laughs> but it's actually more focused and more spiritual and it, it is definitely in the context of prayer and, and reflection. So, I mean, just to, to finish a little bit part of this, of the story, what about, what about this amazing miracle of the baby Isa? you know, speaking, I mean, obviously, you know, we can speak about this at length, but what do you think it tells us about Maryam alayhi salam? Like you have this baby, her baby, you know, speaking. And the first thing he's doing is mm-hmm. saying he's a Ramad of Allah and he's defending his mother. Yeah. What does that say about her and mothers <laughs> in general? Yeah, that's a good question. So first, there's this is really unique part of the Quran. because, And when you look at biblical and chronic stories, you see that this is something distinct because we don't have a talking Jesus in the in, in the Bible, but we do have a talking Isa, and he. This is considered part of the miracle of Isa, part of the miracle of Maryam, alayhi salam, and she and and Isa is defining himself, right? He's saying that Abdullah, he's been given a kitab similar to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He's been made a prophet, and then it talks about how he is going to engage in salah and zakat as long as he's living. And then to your point, Salim, he then talks about his mother, right? And he, he says, right? And he, he specifically mentions his mom mm-hmm. and says, and I've been commanded to be good to my mother, right? And I have, God has not made me arrogant or, or defiant. So part of his prophecy, part of his example is being good to his his mom, and and then it kind of concludes and says, "Wasanamu ana yoma waditu wayoma umutu wayoma ubathu haya." The peace be on, upon the day that he was born with Maryam, the day that he will die, and that the day that he'll be raised up. So, in, in many ways, this is a kind of beautiful expression of the Islamic creed. So, this is part of the the importance mm-hmm. of looking at these figures in comparison to maybe biblical or or those found in the Gospels or the Torah, but also seeing them as Islamic, that Islam has a unique take on them, mm-hmm. that he is someone that is a prophet, he engages in salah and zakah, he's someone that is good to his parents, and that he is someone that is going to die, he's mortal, and that he believes in the day of judgment. So this is a, actually 
a great formulation of a, of a Muslim and Islamic creed. You know, we could obviously talk about Maryam and Isa you know, for, for a long, <laughs> a long time, 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 but, you know, time won't permit it. But, I mean, I want to sort of shift gears a little bit um, and speak about one point or ask you about one point, which is this debate that um, exists about uh, the prophecy of, of Maryam, a.s. was she a prophet? Um, can you talk a little bit about this, this issue um, and why is, it is, why is it important or why isn't it important? Yeah, so, so this debate I think is important because it shows how uh, our religious scholars actually looked at the Qur'an and they noticed things that sometimes we may overlook and they were fair in their understanding and their definitions regardless of gender and you know patriarchy and other things uh, that continue to exist or existed in their time. So when you look at definitions of prophecy, one of the definitions that people use is that you have direct communication from God. And this could take the form of a dream, right? So we saw that in with Ibrahim, in Yaraf and Manam. It could also take the form of, of Jibreel, alayhi you know, So he, Jibreel goes to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi and initiates the revelation. So here in Surah Maryam, we see a clear example that says, فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا Right, so our spirit, which majority of scholars understand as Jibreel, is sent to her and is comes as a human being. So, in, even the famous Hadith of Jibreel, that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is sitting, mm-hmm. and that a man actually comes in that no one has seen before, and he comes to teach the people their religions. So, if we take that definition, then Maryam is a prophet, even though she's never mentioned in the Quran as Nabiya, right? But if we take that definition as Ibn Hazm and Qurtubi and others have taken, then we have to say, oh, females can be prophets within Islam. And we have the example of Maryam. However, other scholars like Ibn Kathir, they mention, well, I never explicitly mentions that she's a prophet and she never really goes to her people in, the, in kind of a sense of da'wah, right. right? That she's calling them or she has a book and she's mentioned as Siddiqa and you know, Yusuf alayhi salam is also mentioned as Siddiq. So she's a righteous person. She's one of the greatest women, if not the greatest of all, women of all time. But he didn't necessarily see her at following the line of other prophets. So I think this debate is is relevant for us because it shows how scholars elevated Maryam to the highest paradigm that they had available. Some saw her as a prophet. Some saw her mm-hmm. as a righteous but regardless, there's this kind of this ijmat, there's this consensus that whatever scholar you're reading, they saw her as a model of emulation for both men and women. What do you think is, I mean, this is sort of a topic that I think has garnered a lot of attention more recently because of the social context we live in. Whereas I think, you know, the, the you know, we're talking about, you know, this, and it's not a modern debate. I mean, this is, you mentioned Ibn Hazm al Qurtubi and, you know, this is from a long time ago that some of these commentators, you know, came to this conclusion. And as you said, others, and probably the majority of under majority, probably if you correct me wrong, you know, would say that she wasn't, she was not a prophet, but, um, is this question really, um, an important one that needs to be answered or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's it's sort of the Quran is, is not very clear about the specific, you know, demarcation, right? And so you have different commentators coming with different meanings, right? But regardless, and going back to our previous podcast about um, the sons of sacrifice, right? I mean, over time, the understanding and current understanding is that, like, the majority is that it is Ismail, who was a son that was sacrificed, to be sacrificed by Ibrahim alayhi salam. But we know that there were previous people who, uh, you know, commentators who believed it was Ishaq. There were previous Sahaba who believed it was Ishaq. But I think the point is that we made in the last podcast, is this, is this detail really important? Does it distract from the, the, the meanings that we're supposed to get from the story in itself? Yeah, absolutely. That's, a, that's an excellent point as well. So, so I, I agree with you that this debate, you know, whether she's a prophet or not, is, is not, I think, essential. The more essential point is, can we see her as a model of emulation? Mm-hmm, right. And then can we, in contemporary times, value, support, and endorse female scholarship, Mm -hmm. spirituality, leadership within our communities. And I think I've, you know, I've seen a shift now that, you know, we, Mm Shad and I are both members of Adams, and we've seen more female scholars. We've seen Mm -hmm. more 
female uh, sheikhas. You know, we see more when you go to seminaries that we have women speaking and sharing their knowledge and, and their experience. So I think that's really what, how it's relevant uh, now today. But at the same time, you know, like if she was a prophet, that doesn't change Allahu Alam, right? If she was a prophet, I don't believe it changes anything that what it means for women's agency. Just mm-hmm. if she was not a prophet, it doesn't change the same agency of women, right? I mean, like the whole point, the, the, the story itself proves, proves, proves what we need to know about agency of, of, of women, right? You know, and I, I feel like this sort of issue can trigger people in both ways. It triggers like some people who are like, oh, this is like, you know, ultra feministic dis- discourse. And like, you know, it's like they're defending the tradition from all these threats. And then on the other hand, it, it, it you know, it's, it's a trigger that, well, if she's not a prophet, then what are you saying about, you know, uh, women today and their agency? You know, it, it's, I mean, I, I understand it's a very loaded question. It's a loaded, it's a very difficult question. Yeah, no, I hear, I hear what you're saying. It could be read in either direction, I guess. As a researcher and someone who's writing on this, my hope is that when to expose Muslims to Islamic history and the range of possibilities right. and to to look that, okay, this is one spectrum of the debate and this is another. So we can actually live in communities that are more tolerant of different opinions exactly, and can yeah. affirm one another, but we can still work together yeah. and, 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 and build communities together. So I think that's kind of, as, as a historian, that's always a goal of mine to have a more nuanced kind of complex dynamic understanding of your faith and identity. Sometimes I also feel that these questions say more about the questioner yes. perhaps than the actual you know subject being questioned. And, and look, this goes back again going back to the time of the Prophet ﷺ, where you had the Quraysh that said, why did you become Prophet? Why didn't one of the great men of Mecca or the great men of Taif, why weren't they designated? But why is it you? Almost because they're, they're not asking, what they're essentially saying is, I have an ideal in my mind of what is appropriate for a honorific like a prophet. And so therefore, you don't fit that ideal because you come from a lower class, you come from Banu Hash, you come from whatever. Right. But what we're trying to do is basically presuppose ourselves in the position of Allah. Right. Allah is saying, I chose this person and he is prophet, regardless of what you think a prophet should or should not be. Right. And so I think in some ways it was more of a, you know, the, the questioner is the one that's being challenged here is like, why is it important for you that, that the prophet be a person from one of the noblemen of Mecca or one of the noblemen of whatever? So in, in some ways for us, you know, the, to your point, um, whether she is a prophet or not, right? Whether or not that, is it important for us to give her that honorific? Or is it important for us to understand that in terms of spirituality, in terms of this maqam that she has, this station that she has with Allah, that's what we should be going after, right? How do we achieve that? Because she's honored in the Quran in a time in which women were not very honored in that right. society. Yeah. And, and by and large until... You know, arguably, maybe even the suffrage movement of the modern times, right? Like there are, there, there's um, a lot to be said there around, and a lot to unpack around how we are reading our own kind yes, of biases yeah, in, into the text. Yeah, I mean, like I think with you know, with a lot of Quranic commentary, right? If you go beyond like internal commentary, which is using the Quran to, um, you know, to to explain the Quran, or beyond the the, the hadith of the Prophet or the sayings of the Sahaba, or some of the you know the early commentators, uh, you know. Once you go back past that and you start using some of these secondary tertiary sources of commentary, you know, I think I think we lose the forest for the se- trees in the sense that like those things are 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 used by these commentators to you know add some layers of understanding, reflection about yeah. the text, but they don't necessarily have to be a definitive answer. Right. And I think we have to mature as as, as readers of the Quran and that like we can be willing to uh, see that uh, a commentary that says that Ishaq is the son of sacrifice. Uh, in the same way that we see Ismail, yeah. the son of Zacharias. I remember, Shad, I think when we did that podcast, I don't know if it was before or after the podcast, you said you did the khutbah, and you like you said you didn't intentionally <laughs> say anything about the son, but like some oh, uncle yeah. came up to you afterwards yeah. and be like, hey, I noticed you weren't specifically saying Ismail. <laughs> What's wrong, right? You know, right. so I think it's it's the same way in the sense that like, you know, let's not let this, this specific detail distract us from the, the message. Yeah. And it shouldn't deter us either way. I think we should, we, we really not have to, you know, mature spiritually in a way that these things don't trigger us, yeah. whether it's one way or the other, but uses it as a point of reflection and to learn and to, you know, guide our life. 
Yeah, I think you said it better than myself <laughs> in terms of how to understand. I think, and I like how you describe the relationship between the text and the commentary and back to the text. So a lot of times people read the Quran, but they actually don't look at the commentary at all and the different interpretations. So they may be stuck on like, oh, this verse means this, and it can only mean this in this context, and then this person has to do this. But then when you read the commentary, you see all the different possibilities and the different opinions. But there's also a danger, to your point, that you could get stuck in the commentary. You could get lost there, and you could start resurrecting historical medieval debates that no longer exist. So there's always this importance of actually returning back to the text, right? What does the text actually say? What's the text actually, its purpose and meaning? And then maybe divorce from these medieval commentators. And then maybe one step further, how do we take this text back to the community and make it relevant to people's daily life and struggles? Certainly, this has uh, been a very interesting discussion. Um, you just, I mean, can you give us any uh, timeline about your book? Uh, your yeah, spot? so I'm trying to wrap up. I have like one more chapter to go. So hopefully trying to get this done in the summer. And then, you know, it takes the public, the public right. publisher right, takes right. some time to put it together. But I'm hoping early next year. Inshallah. And Inshallah. I'm excited yeah. because I think there is a, this interest in the Muslim community to mm-hmm. talk about the Quran and the balagha and the rhetoric, talk about issues of spirituality, female leadership. In in Christian communities, when I talk to them, they there is this sense that they want to have a positive relationship with Muslims, mm-hmm. that many of them want to go beyond Islamophobia and, and hate speech. And then I think there's just a general audience of, of people who, who are maybe unmasked, you know, people who are still committed to religion, to the deen. Uh, but they're trying to understand themselves with when this common uh, spirituality. So yeah, so I'm excited to see oh, what the reception is going to be like. To it, yeah, we're excited for it as well. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, um, Eunice, for coming on and chat. Of course, you know, um, I was lo- I was love being with you guys. It's been a while, you know. <laughs> you know, you can always you can always tell because I, uh, I would get too excited when I'm around you guys and I, I talk too much. <laughs> people complain about it, like, "Hey, you were talking too much." Nobody complains to me. No, maybe, so, maybe, your wife, maybe your wife. Maybe your wife. Okay, so we, we, you know, uh, we had to find another like holiday time to get <laughs> yeah, our next yeah, exactly. episode. And like, I don't know, something related to, uh, I don't know. We'll find something. We'll find something. So, something. Alhamdulillah. But um, you know, again, thank you for for joining us. To all our listeners, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Remember to check almadina.org for the latest uh, episodes and other programs Al Medina is doing. Uh, share the podcast with friends and family, um, anyone you think might benefit. So subscribe to the podcast. And until then, assalamualaikum. Peace be unto you. As-salamu.